Okay, welcome back from the spring break. And the lecture we're going to do today is the final lecture in the optim or the minimization optimization. So I pulled together a few links that give sort of an overview into a very nice uh, area of mathematics called optimization theory. So the first thing I've done is put a link together to describe what optimization is. And optimization, as it says here, is made up of three basic ingredients. There's a function, one or more functions that we want to minimize or possibly maximize. A classic example is if you're a business uh, application, you might not ma maximize the profit or minimize the cost. Or if you're fitting a squares line uh, to data, you might want to minimize the error uh, of a particular line, find a line with a minimal loose square area. There's a set of unknowns or variables, usually which have physical significance in the problem, and there may be two kinds of variables. And there's also generally a set of constraints. So the classic optimization problem is to find values of the variable that minimize or maximize the objective function while they're satisfying the constraints. Now, you can actually formulate optimization problems where there is no objective function. And all you're doing is satisfying the constraints. So this is what they call a feasibility problem. A feasible solution is just a solution which satisfies the constraints. You can also have more than one objective function. So that would be a matrix uh, of objective functions. You can also obviously have to have some kind of variables. If there's no variables, uh, the objective function doesn't really make any sense, nor does the problem constraints. And you can have minimization, maximization, optimization problems without constraints. And this is called unconstrained optimization. And here's an example of unconstrained optimization, the link here. OK. So getting back to the uh, home page here for this lecture, I've pulled a link from uh, Wolfram's Math World site on optimization theory, and there's quite a lot of links here. Um, most of them I've checked through. Uh, there's optimization research is, is quite an old one. It dates back from early, at least the 50s. We've already talked about the calculus of variations. That's a very classical dating back from the 1700s area. It's optimization theory essentially is a generalization of the calculus of variations. You can think of Calculus of variations sort of is a specific method for minimizing or maximizing. Control theory, which I'll talk about later on in the course, is again a more modern differential equations a specific approach to optimization. Convex optimization theory, there's a very nice theory for convex functionals because convex functionals will have a unique global maximum or minimum. And there's also methods which are tuned to convex optimization theory. Also, if your function is not convex, it's not clear that you have a unique uh, minimization function. So for example, let's get the uh, sketch pad out here. For classic one-dimensional problems, so if you want to find the minimum of a one-dimensional function, say f of one variable, if you graph the function, if it's convex, it's clear it will have a single minimum. And you can actually look at necessary conditions for the existence of a minimum, assuming that f is continuous. So if f is continuous and convex, it will have a unique minimizer or maximizing point. So we're, we're looking for some function or some x star 
and given this function, we want to find this. Now we'll talk about some algorithms that you can use to find the max or the min here. But in 1D, it's a very simple problem, particularly if, if the function has a derivative. Now if you look in higher dimensions, or if the function's not convex, now you could have a function which is not convex because it looks like that, but it's still monotonely increasing and decreasing on these intervals. So convexity is not a necessary condition, although it is a sufficient condition for a unique maximum in. Also, you can show that convex functions have derivative almost everywhere. So there's a whole theory that's been developed called optimization theory, and it's tied into some other uh, branches here that I won't talk about today, uh, namely decision theory, game theory. We will talk a little bit about linear programming. We won't talk about Markov chains or queuing theory. So let's talk a little bit about what we mean by an objective function. Now an objective function is exactly what you want to minimize. Now this is some function f of one or more variables. So I'll just denote it as a single real valued function of one or more variables. So this might be a function of x1, x2, et cetera, xn. So a finite number of variables. And what we're trying to do is the problem is to minimize f of x for x in some region subject to constraints. For example, a constraint is generally the form of an inequality. So constraints are usually inequalities. I'll put that in quotes or parentheses. They're usually inequalities. However, you can have, for example, constraints that, um, that the solution must be an integer. Other types of constraints. So the solution must be an integer. Now the inequalities could be linear or nonlinear. Linear inequalities usually say that the, the solution has to be on one side of a half plane. So you have some linear condition of the variables is positive. So ai, xi is positive. And all this says is that the solution dotted in with some vector is positive. So it lies in the direction of that vector. Now that means that that vector, if you look at the plane, defined as the normal to that vector, then the solution must be on one side of that plane or the other. Nonlinear constraints might be, for example, that the solution has to lie in some ball or some circle. So this would say a sub i x minus x i minus some constant c i squared is less than some k. So it's in some general ellipse. So you can have linear or nonlinear constraints or possibly non-inequality type constraints such as the solution must be an integer. The objective function will assume that we'll have a single real valued function just for simplicity. And we can assume that it's a function of one or more variables and the general problem is to minimize f. Now, this is no real uh, restriction because if you minimize f, 
that's the same as maximizing negative f. So you can turn a minimization problem into a maximization problem with a, a trivial um, example here. So we talked about constraints, we talked about the objective function, we won't talk about methods quite yet. The variables, as I mentioned, are usually physically significant quantities. They might be the price or the amount or the quantity ordered in units of a thousand or whatever. Now, a classical example of optimization, which you've probably all heard of, is the so-called traveling salesman problem. Now, the traveling salesman problem is a graph theory problem that says, given a number of nodes in, say, two dimensions, what is the path that connects each of these nodes together, which has the minimum length or minimum total distance? So the traveling salesman problem is a very famous problem. And it's really, there's no general method for solving. It's known to be NP, non-polynomial uh, a problem, and those are what we call hard problems. So this is a hard problem, NP problem. And there's really no general algorithms right now. But the statement of the problem is just very simple. You're given some region, and you're given some points, say point 0.1, point 0.2, point 0.3, point 0.4, et cetera, up to point n. You're given n points, and then you're supposed to connect them by means of a graph with the shortest distance. Now you can see why it's called the traveling salesman problem because if you're a salesman and you have to visit n different cities, assuming there's roads connecting any two cities, you, so that's not a constraint, you can always go from one city to the other and we assume that you can go a straight line you want to connect these lines by some path. Et cetera, and then say bounce over that one and then bounce over here. You want to connect a route. Now obviously you can retrace your route. There's no uh, requirement that you only have to go one way. But if you backtrack, obviously there's probably a shorter distance uh, connecting the two cities uh, that only connects the cities once. Now, it is possible you could visit a city twice uh, depending on how the graph works. Now, the, gen the, the general solution of this problem is not known. This is an open problem. It's a very hard problem. Uh, this is analogous to, for example, um, scheduling airlines. If you have, if you look at the problem of you have airlines at all these different cities and you have to connect flights between the cities in such a way that all the passengers go between, can go between various cities in a way that minimize, maximizes the profit and minimizes the gas cost. So you want to minimize distance. Now, if your distances are not linear, for example, there may be geodesics or something, curved paths, or, for example, if you have uh, tailwinds that go west to east or east to west, that can affect, obviously, the cost of computing this. But if, you, if, if for every path there is a cost, the problem is uh, minimizing the cost, and if the cost is equally weighted and disproportional to the straight line distance, then Minimizing cost is the same as minimizing the path length. So the traveling salesman problem is a, is a historically very important problem that is still not yet completely solved. So the problem in graph theory statement is requiring the most efficient, that is, least total distance circuit that you can take connecting each of these ends 
cities. No general method of solution is known and the problem is NP hard. Okay, NP hard means it's an equivalent class of all NP problems. So that has to do with complexity and algorithmic complexity. Okay, so that's a that's an obvious, historically important set of, uh, a problem. There's some other problems that you can look for that are uh, discrete in this sense. So if you look at the discrete optimization problems, this example here, at the very bottom of it are a list of links to problems. So there's the traveling salesman problem that we just looked at. So you have to connect, you have to take a series of destinations and here's a path that's a candidate for, say, the, the minimal distance. Okay, another one is uh, called the shortest path problem. Looks like it's taking a little bit to download here. It's similar to the traveling salesman problem. So this is a variation that says if you have a starting and ending point in a graph, you have to find the shortest distance connecting two points. So if that's S, the start, and T is the end, find the shortest distance between S and T connected by edges in the graph. So that's obviously like a map problem where you're trying to go between two distances and find the interstate distance. Uh, set packing problem, find the minimal amount of covering sets or the largest number of disjoint subsets that cover S and such that no two of them intersect pairwise. The set covering problem is another uh, discrete optimization problem. So in this case, it says what's the smallest sub number of subsets so that the union of them is the whole set. I apologize, this is, has some tech in it here, so it doesn't, uh, for some reason, uh, will not show in my browser. Uh, the vertex coloring problem color the vertices of a set V with a minimum number of colors so that each edge has different color and no two edges share, no two edges are the same for color mapping problem. Job scheduling is a variant of this. Network flow is another problem. Uh, networking is a, a, a large graph problem that's very practical, just finding the closest or the best efficient way to route internet traffic through a network is an optimization problem. This is the so-called knapsack problem, which you can read about later. Uh, then you can look at the general linear programming problem. Now the linear programming problem that we'll actually uh, talk about a little bit more is you have to minimize or maximize a linear objective function and you have a set of linear inequalities. Now it's fairly easy to see that a single inequality means that you're on one side rather than a half plane. So if you have a set of inequalities that are linear, the feasible set will be a region with straight line segments or planar um, sets as its boundary. So in two dimensions, you'll get a polygon. So you're trying to minimize a linear function of a polygon, and that actually in two dimensions has a nice uh, geometric uh, visualization. Now, for the classic problem of finding a maximum or minimum of a single variable, we have essentially all the elements of the theory. So if you want to find a maximum or a minimum, of f of x on some interval, you 
Now we'll assume that it's closed. And if the function has properties, say if f is continuous and differentiable, you can look at the graph and essentially see that at the minimum, a necessary condition is that for an interior maximum or minimum that the derivative will be equal to zero. Now this is if it's if the derivative is continuously differentiable. Uh, if in the case of a function where the derivative fails to exist, but nevertheless changes sign, here obviously the slope is not zero, it's not even defined, but it's a minimum. So if it's continuously differentiable, that means it's derivative is a continuous function, then a necessary condition in the interior is that there'd be a critical point, f prime equals zero. Ex extremal point will have this property. Now, at the end point, so places to look for, so we have what are known as a critical point. This is all going back to calculus. Critical points are either the end points or places where the derivative equals zero or fails to exist. Now, in the sense, if you, if you count the endpoints as only one-sided derivatives, then they don't have a two-sided derivative, so you include the endpoints. So endpoints are often thrown in here. So the candidates for looking at a minimum max are the places where the derivative fails to exist, or the derivative equals zero, or possibly the endpoints. Now, these are not uh, sufficient conditions because you can have, for example, very easy counterexamples. For example, x cubed, you can have a function which has f prime of x equals zero at the origin. So this is 3x squared is equal to zero at x equals zero. So this vanishes, but the derivative doesn't change sign, and it's just, it's a um, inflection point, but not a, it's a, it's a critical point, but it's not a local max or min, it's just an inflection point. So the problem gets a little bit harder if you are in multiple dimensions. Now, uh, clearly from the graph, a function doesn't necessarily have a unique max or min. You can easily come up with a function that say looks like this. Let's just put a smooth graph through here. And you might have points down here which are local minimums. So local min are these black dots. If I change color, the red dots might be the local maximum. And you might have still blue dots at the end points. So clearly, if you were looking for a local max or a local min, what local max or local min is that this local max is just larger than its neighbors, but not necessarily the largest or the smallest. But it's clear that a global max or a global min has to be in the set of local max or local min. And we'll assume that we have just a finite number of these. So clearly these are found by looking at the critical points. If this is continuously differentiable or differentiable almost everywhere, you look at the places where the derivative is zero, or fails to exist, or the endpoints, 
and you look for among the class of extreme points. If you're in, this is in one dimension, of course. The two-dimensional or three multi-dimensional analog of that would be if you have a surface with a local min, the tangent plane basically you know has zero slope there. So we look for if it's if f and f prime are continuous. Or I should say if f and the gradient of f, since this is multidimensional. If f and the gradient of f are continuous, we look for a place where the gradient vanishes. And this is a zero vector. Or fails to exist, one or more derivatives fail to exist and on the boundary. Now the boundary of this could be some kind of region that's, that's complicated. Okay, so there's, there's some region down here that this is a surface over. So this is your region omega that's your set of points that the objective function is defined at. This is the graph of the objective function. And if it's convex, it's going to have a unique local max or min. And you can pretty much see if it has sufficiently smooth, you can find it just by solving or finding these critical points. Now what happens, by the way, if the function's not smooth? What if f is not differentiable? So that means that they're not continuously differentiable. Well, looking one dimension, we really don't want to look at this. If we have a case where the function is discontinuous, there might be a maximum or a local. This is obviously a local max, but Finding this would be a real bit unless you look at the points of this continuity. So we're going to assume that it's continuous. We're not going to allow that. Okay, so this could be as bad as a Cantor function, but usually the derivative will only fail to exist in a certain finite number of points. More usually, suppose f it's just the output of some computer program. So in other words, you give it a set of values, x1, x2, et cetera. Like, for example, you give it a stock market, set of quotes from the stock market, you turn the crank and you come out with an F. But it's not excuse me, x2, et cetera, it's not a function that you can actually write down. And since you can't write down, you can't actually compute a derivative, so you can't find the critical points. So this is algorithmically generated, but there's no um, analytic or form for the function. But, so what would you do in this case? Let's look at this case a little bit more because you can sort of see the germs of what are called search algorithms. Now search algorithms are methods by which you are trying to find the max or the minimum of a function which doesn't necessarily have an analytic form. So suppose we just have a set of discrete points. So suppose this thing it looks something like this. And you compute data and suppose there's some noisy data and comes in like this. And, and suppose it's not even linearly ordered. So I mean, suppose this is say x1 uh, and this is x2 and this is x3 down here. And this is say x4 up here 
etc. So clearly, one option is just do a complete search. Just check every value. Well, if you have a discrete number of points and a finitely number, this is okay for small values. But if you have billions and billions of values, which it might be possible, it might be too expensive to do this. So I'd say this is sort of the brute force approach. This is very expensive. Another way to search for a minimum is to use um, a criteria that essentially says that the secant changes line. So if you take two adjacent points, and they, they may not be consecutive, but just you look at the secant line through two points, say so these two points and these two points here, this is a point where the secant line changes direction. So an option two is to calculate, uh, look at the slope, uh, compute pairs of secants, and check for change in sign. Now, you might say, well, why don't we just sort these values of x and then just check pairwise or something like that. But the sorting algorithm can take a fair amount of time itself. So um, that's one way to do it. Another way might be to check intervals. You might, uh, this is more or less a random type approach. You might subdivide into intervals. And then suppose you subdivide it into intervals of, by some, and you look at a representative point in each interval, and you find the minimum of those, and then you find that interval, and then subdivide it, and keep trying to find the minimum and, uh, of those intervals. And that might get you into the region, if you're lucky, of a local max or a local min. And then just check randomly random points, say, in each interval. Say so one per interval, and then con continue the process. Now, these are examples of what I would call discrete optimization. You're only given a discrete point. They may not be integers, but certainly this is a discrete problem, because there's no possible way that you're going to define a derivative or a gradient here. So in that case, the secant has to take the place of a gradient. And instead of f prime equals 0, you have the secant changing sign as, as a condition. So these discrete problems are very hard, particularly when they have to be integer-valued solutions, et cetera. And there's actually a conference here, and there's a number of papers. Uh, you can just check. A, a number of, you can see right away that these discrete problems have a lot to do with graph theory and combinatorics. So these are a lot, all of these are in PostScript. If you want to convert PostScript to PDF file, there are ways to do that. So if you click on a random PostScript file, I think it will ask you, do you want to convert it uh, to the stellar? Let's see, I have Acrobat to still on here, so if I open it, it will copy the PostScript into a temporary file and then convert PostScript to PDF. If you're on the Unix system, there's a PS2 PDF file that will do the same thing if you download the PostScript file. Um, this is failing because it's not finding it into the temporary directory. But if I were to save that a file, it would... Um, convert it to a PDF file just fine. So there was uh, a whole conference devoted to discrete optimization in 1999. Now, a related area of study is in control theory. Now, control theory has to do, and here's actually a nice link. You can use a, a couple of PDF files, chapters out of books, 
Uh, for example, number two is what is the mathemat what is mathematical control theory? If you click on that, it printed off. These are excerpts from books. This one by Springer Verlag. And you can print these books out. So it'll say this is like pages 1 through 24. And you can read that at, at your leisure. But let me try to just describe the essence of control theory. The essence of control theory is you have a system of differential equations. So you have a set of differential equations with a parameter. Now, for example, suppose you're uh, trying to guide a rocket ship to the moon. So you have some space shuttle that's traveling to the moon. Now, you could, because these orbits are sufficiently well known, just shoot off the rocket ship so that at exactly the right time it will orbit the moon, but you would like to be able to adjust the, the navigational systems of the rocket to account for various contingencies, like it's slightly unbalanced or something happens during takeoff or whatever you want to land. You don't want to just shoot it once and then rely on luck to, to orbit the moon. I mean, the computer programs are good, but maybe not that good. So what you want to do is control the trajectory. Now, you can tr control a direct trajectory. Say, so here's my crude little rocket here. You might have a little rockets on the edges that can angle it in different or pitch in the eye. You can rotate it about its axis, et cetera. So you have these abilities to control, say, in, say, three coordinate directions. And what you want to do is you, you can set up a system of differential equations, just Newton's law of motion, F equals ma. But what is your variable is how long and what angle these uh, rockets will fire. So you'll have a set of differential equations plus a controllable parameter. Okay, so suppose I have a set of differential equations and so I maybe set, call it f of, say, t, x, dx, dt, and some alpha of t equal to zero. So there's my system of equations. I might have f1, f2, f3, and x1, x2, x3. So I might even, this is just this first order system of equations. But it has a parameter one or more parameters, which I call alpha. Now, what you might want to do is you might have an objective function that is the cost, like the amount of fuel or the amount of time. So you might be able to calculate the time as the integral of the velocity or um, you might you might want to minimize time, or you might want to minimize fuel cost, or you might want to maximize some other factor. But these generally are going to be some cost function, which is typically called J, which is a function of the solution. But it all, it's not only a function of the solution, let me raise that parenthesis, it's a function of the solution and alpha. So what we want to do is minimize j of x of t over alpha. So I, I have, this alpha is called a control, so I want to minimize something. For each alpha, there's an x, so I could think of alpha as a variable 
and minimize x over the set of alphas that are feasible. So, and this is what computer programs do. They will have, over a certain range of conditions, this alpha will take on certain values. And then if they're looking for a global optimization, or they will use this control to try to minimize j. So this is an optimization problem but with a parameter that you get con to control. So it's, an, it's of the form of an optimization problem, but has but with a control. Now, these may be of the kind of controls. For example, there's a bang-bang control problem where the alpha is either on or off. So there's a continuous control problem. The alphas may have to obey certain constraints. There's a continuous control problem, and you may have discrete control. So these are closely related to the optimization problems. Another kind of problem, we talked about continuous optimization. These are where you can use differentials or discrete optimization where you essentially have discrete points. Integer programming problems are optimization problems, and here's a tutorial on it. There are optimization problems where the constraints are that the solution must be, take on integer values. So for example, if you're solving a problem in number of items or maximum number of items to produce to maximize a profit, obviously you can't produce like a third of a television set. So what you're really asking is what's the optimal solution for an integer number of television sets to maximize the profit. There's also a set of problems called dynamic programming problems. These are a set of programming problems where you care about the behavior at certain points in time. So you're optimizing, if you will, point by point in time. There's a number of geometric methods that are useful here. For example, let's go back to this well, let's start a new one here. So here's a simple geometric method for of the following problem. Suppose I have a linear objective function. What that means is my function f or j is just a linear combination of the variables, if I have n of them. So this is clearly linear. I also have linear constraints. So I might have, for example, ci, xi, or this might actually be j, is greater than 0, say, for each i. So you sum over all the integers, or j equals 1 to n for i equals 1 to m. So I have m constraints that are all in here. If you look at this problem here, you can actually solve it very nicely geometrically. OK, so if I have an axis like this, a set of linear constraints in two dimensions are just a series of straight lines. So your solution might lie on one side of this line. It might lie on this side of this one. It might have to be less than this, or here, or here, or here. So it might have to be in the interior. So this might be the, the feasible region inside these set of points. Okay, so the union of all these constraints, and let me just highlight that here by a pretty nice little fat highlighting pen. So it might be here, 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 here. Okay, so this will be the feasible set or the constraint region. So this is the feasible set. This is the set of all points satisfying constraints. So this is the set of all x 
so that x satisfies the constraint. Now, if there are linear constraints, it's not hard to argue that the boundary is a polygon or planar. And if you're minimizing or maximizing a linear function, you can show very easily that the minimum or maximum of a linear function must occur at a, at a vertex or along an edge. Because if you look at the contours of constant f, if f is a constant, then it gives you a straight line or a plane. So the lines of constant f, so let's make those green. So let's look at these green lines. Let's So these green lines would be lines of constant f. So suppose the lines of constant f, all of which are parallel, run like this. So it's pretty clear that you can find a line that just touches it down there and just touches it up through here. And if you really, these lines will all be parallel because they all have the same slope, and they'll be in the form of an increasing and decreasing direction. So if you look one way or the other, these lines will either increase in value or decrease in value. Now, if you move along any point inside here until you hit the vertex, and then move along an edge, you can see that if the edge is parallel to these lines of constant f, you can have an edge which is all of which are maximum values, but normally, unless they're parallel, you're going to have a single point which is a max or a min. So the candidate points here are this, say, this point right here and this point right here. Now, it's pretty obvious that you can get to these points. The max or the min has to be on an edge or a vertex. So, it's easy to show that max or min lies on an edge or a vertex. So that gives you your algorithm very easily. You can just list all the vertices and if the function is the same at two vertices on a line segment, then it's constant all the way through. Or if, it, if they're all different, you just have a finite number of points to look for. You list them, and you just pick the max. So your algorithm to find the solution is you just look at all the x points, x sub i, um, the vectors x sub i, and you look at your function f of x i, and you just have sets of values. And one of them will be the maximum, and one will be the minimum. So you just find, you just list pairs of points. So you find the maximum or minimum. Now, this is a nice algorithm. And you find it by inspection. This, this works as long as you only have a finite number of vertices. And even in higher dimensions, this is not too bad, because you can go ahead and find all the pairwise intersections and find all these points and just add something like 10,000 variables, 10,000 dimensions. It might be hard actually just finding the corners of that huge simplex. Okay. Uh, actually, I did mention the word simplex, and this, this is called a linear programming problem, by the way, because you have a linear objective function and a linear constraint. This is called an LP, or a linear programming problem. And nonlinear programming problem is called NLP, not NP. NP is reserved for the non-polynomial algorithms. 
and deterministic polynomial time algorithms. Now, the geometric method has an advantage in low dimensions. It's very easy to, to, to see why it works. So it's easy to visualize. But it's hard to, to program in sort of a way that's sort of generic. Another method called the simplex method was developed to solve linear programming problems. And there's a more efficient polynomial time algorithm called Karmakar's algorithm that came out in 1984. It's a, an example of an interior point problem. So the Karmakar's algorithm is actually used more than the simplex method in most cases. But the simplex method was developed in 19, let's see, does that have the link there? Uh, it should have a link to simplex. Yeah, this was invented in 1947. And, and until 1984 with Karmacher's algorithm, it was the algorithm for the linear programming problem. So the simplex method is a method that was created in 1947. And it solves the L linear programming problem very efficiently. As a, essentially as a series of linear Gaussian elimination problems. Of Gaussian elimination problems. Essentially matrix problems. I can't spell. I'll go over the simplex method probably next lecture. Uh, this was improved in 1984, improved in 1984 by Karmacher's algorithm. Which speeded up the simplex method. The simplex method was used heavily in business because often they have linear constraints because the variables are quantities and the constants are like prices or costs. So you're averaging or you're finding minimum or maximum of linear combinations of items and units and things like that subject to linear inequalities, price constraints. So uh, the simplex algorithm is incredibly useful in business and other methods. There is sort of a nice derivation of the simplex method that we'll get to next time. Uh, this fellow has put together sort of a series of slides that go from the Gaussian elimination procedure, he even has a little JavaScript calculator here, and then it can go on through the non-negative constraints, walk through the objective functions with the calculator, And then finally, click on the optimization itself. So this uh, fellow has a, a site that you can actually go through the derivation of the simplex method, not mathematically or rigorously, but fairly intuitively. So we've talked about the linear programming problems. They're just, as I said, linear functions and linear constraints. There are some types of problems that have, for example, you'll see here numerical methods. There's uh, genetic algorithms and simulated annealing algorithms. So if you, the algebraic, simplex method is an algebraic solution. It differs from the geometric solution because you can implement it without having to visualize or construct anything geometrically. So this is completely um, programmable. It's fairly simple to program. That's the simplex method. 
I'm not sure about car markers algorithm because I've never programmed that. Okay. Now there are some. Uh, there's a vast literature of numerical methods. Now I've actually put a link to the bottom. This the so-called decision tree for optimization software. It has a, a lot, sort of a, a laundry list of benchmarks and test cases and uh, sources of codes and everything else like that. And speaking of sources of codes. Uh, the very last algorithm, or the very last link that I'll show you is this NetWide search. I've mentioned it previously. This is a search engine. If you put in, for example, optimization, or so let's try simplex. And if you click on that, this will give you links to all the, it had 14 matches, so there are 13 links to the simplex algorithm here. Some of these are PDF files, and some of them are actual codes. So this is a simplex solution to an overdetermined linear system. Uh, this ACM is the Association of Computing Machinery. This is the ACM journal. Volume 17, page 319. So if you click on this, uh, you just get the algorithm itself. This is uh, probably a Fortran, judging by its structure, yeah. So you can cut and paste this, and if you want a nice little Fortran algorithm to do the simplex method, there you go. There's usually nicely sub, you know, uh, subroutine here. So M is the number of equations, N is the number of unknowns, M2 is equal to M plus 2, N plus 2 is N2, A is an array, B is another array, tolerance is a tolerance. So this is standard Fortran code. Some of these are not in Fortran, but are like C plus plus, et cetera. So this is uh, AMPL solve is LP solve. This is an interface to LP solve. Let's look at that. So the LP solve dot C. This is a Unix make file. There's make files in uh, Microsoft Visual C++. So this would, if you click on LP solve dot C, I'll open it. Uh, hopefully I don't, oops, I happen to have MetroWorks Code Warrior, so it's going to try to compile this thing. So this is what the code looks like. It's just an editor version of MetroWorks Code Warrior. And this is standard C code here. The pound includes define, static ints, et cetera. So you can actually download and compile these. Now some of these are linked, so you have to be careful about dependencies. So if you go on to the next page, it says it found 14. So the rest of the links are on the next page. Some of these are PDF files, and you can read them. So just click on this one here. Let's blow this up a little bit. Oops, this looks like it has an indication here. The NetWide TMS PDF collection is in the front. There's an official copy online. Go to the portal, etc. Okay, so they don't have the PDF files uh, online anymore. Okay, so that's a link to the um, probably the biggest source of numerical algorithms on the web. On the web there's probably more than 10,000 uh, algorithms under NetWide. Uh, some specialized algorithms, like the genetic algorithm, have to do uh, with sort of random or stochastic ways of finding a max or a min. Now, just as an ending point to this, I'll explain why you might want a random or stochastic algorithm. 
Now the problems themselves might be random or stochastic, but you can also have random methods for non-random problems. An example might be something that looks like this, where you, you look at the function uh, on an interval and you, you go in the direction of steepest descent, or in other words, you look at points where the function says always traveling downhill. But then at a certain number of points, you randomly kind of hit this with a jump. You jump out of here. And then you go search downhill. And then at some point, you might jump back over to here, and you might search and keep on going downhill. Now, the point is, that as these jumps are random, so you might have small jumps or large jumps, the point about the jumps is you don't want to get trapped in a local minimum. So you can see, for example, that suppose your function looks like this. You might go down here and you might find this minimum point fairly quickly, but then what will happen is, is one of your random jumps here will take you over to say a point here, and you'll go down here. Now, if this is sufficiently strong minimum here, your random jumps are going to just take you back and you'll fall back down again. So think of it as sort of a marble rolling downhill and every 10 seconds or so it kind of does a random displacement. It will tend to find the global maximum eventually because the jumps, if they're not restricted in size, so that you can always get out of one of these little wells, will take you eventually into a, a point where there's a minimum here. So we might be trying to find, for example, a global minimum as opposed to a local minimum. And this is a very difficult problem, is how do you know that you have a global minimum, not a local minimum? Ways, ways is just to introduce a sort of random perturbation. You just kind of shock the system and restart it. Or another way of doing it, obviously, is to start at different points. So I could take an interval and I could start at various different points in my search algorithm and see which one, if they all go to the same point. And if they do, uh, that'll be the global minimum. So. Robust algorithms to find global optimization points are very tricky and very complex. So finding a global maximum is a much more complex, much harder. And that's what these simulated annealing and genetic algorithms, they put in sort of this random element to allow you to find the global maximum with, it may not be very fast, but eventually it will. So what I tried to show you today is that we've come sort of full circle here. We've talked about a very specialized problem in optimization called the calculus of variations, and we've generalized it slightly by means of optimization. Now, next lecture, set of lectures, this pretty much ends the, what I'd like to talk about today, and I may give some problems in max-min optimization kind of problems for the next lecture, uh, for the next homework assignment. But the next lectures will be out of uh, chapter 12, I believe it is, the real number, the complex numbers in quaternion extensions. So the next lecture will be out of Boaz and Geller uh, on complex uh, numbers in quaternions. So that ends it.